Okay, we're back here on the Mystical Mountain Podcast a couple years later, but we're not going to make it a big gap like that again. Glad to be back at it. And today we've got our guest here, Thomas Seawood. And uh, I'm going to actually let Thomas introduce himself. Uh, I think he could probably do a better job of it than I can, but we're talking Sasquatch today and maybe some other things. So Thomas, thank you very much for coming on the Mystical Mountain. And uh, yeah, please let us know about yourself. Oh, well, first off, Gelakasla, greetings. And I greeted you in my tribal language of Kwakwala from the Kwakwakiwak people of Northern British, Northern Vancouver Island, British Columbia. And I'm from the Kwakwakiwak Nation, a member of the Mamliaha tribe, which is the Maltonites Inlet or the Western Gateway to the Broughton Archipelago. But I'm also half Cree. And uh, I was brought up Northern Vancouver Island. That's where I was born and raised in Alert Bay until I was, you know, around nine I think and then we moved to Vancouver then back to Vancouver Island where I would graduate from Qualicum Beach Tan Shawning Lake Boys Private School but my whole life I've been I guess you could say immersed in Sasquatch Bigfoot which my tribe calls Chunahua so um, some of the viewer listeners out there I'm sure have been to Vancouver Island especially Campbell River and northwards up to Port McNeil take the ferry over to Alert Bay where I was born Alert Bay is an island on Cormorant Island. Half of the island on the northwest side is uh, Numgi's Indian Reservation, along with a small plot of land called the Wilala U for other Kwakwakiwak tribes people to live there. And uh, that's where I was born, grew up. And, you know, I remember the graveyard in downtown Alert Bay with these outstretched arms, big breasts, puckered lips, sleepy eyes mean looking chonakas, female sasquatches at the base of those memorial totem poles in the graveyard well to me i was you know like this design you'll see behind me here this one right here one of my paintings that's a uh, female sasquatch with a basket on her back oh, yeah. and she's stuffing a misbehaving boy into her basket after she rubbed spruce sap on his eyes so he can't see and now she's going after the misbehaving young girl and that's what we we're brought up to believe. You behave yourself, Tommy. Otherwise, Jonah was going to come at night and stick big hairy arm into where you're sleeping and grab you. Shove spruce, rub spruce sap in your eyes from the spruce tree like thick syrup so you can't see. And she's going to shove you either in the basket on her back or a sack like a potato sack like that design right there. That's a sack with misbehaving children in it and a male Sasquatch. But they're going to take you into the forest to a mountain and go way up and they're going to find their invisible home and that's where they're going to boil you up and eat you so you better behave so as a young boy you know i was brought up to believe that sasquatch was pretty terrifying and then you would go up to this ceremonial big house which we call a cuxi and uh, that's where we would have our big celebrations our dances would be held there you know the dances that are owned by a chief and his family because each dance is a society or a crest. So for example, the Chunachua is the highest rank crest you can have the Sasquatch in the Kwakwakiwa culture and society. So at a potlatch that a chief hosts, they will dance their Chunachua. You will see that female Sasquatch come onto the dance floor and posture by, by rubbing their eyes, and yawning and representing throwing bad children in her back or stuffing them in a sack or maybe there's a baby one runs out and jumps onto the Jonahua mother's back so every family has a different interpretation of what an ancestor witnessed in regards to running into a Jonahua Sasquatch and that's our highest rank crest and you see it in those ceremonial big houses to this day and that's why I always tell people, if you're going to be a Sasquatch enthusiast investigator, and I don't use the R word researcher because there is no Sasquatch researchers walking with a heartbeat yet until someone comes forward and says, I am doing as Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall did, and I have an interaction going on with an individual or a family clan of Sasquatch, then they become researchers. They have a subject. Everyone out there is a stumbling bumbling investigator just like i and <laughs> so i never use the r word so anyway the jonah as i stated is very important to my tribe and i think 
you know, after traveling to places like, you know, Oregon, California, I live here in Washington state. I'm actually a Vancouver Island boy, but I've been living down here since COVID with my common law wife, Peggy. But, you know, I've been up to Northwest Territories, lived there for a year. I lived in uh, Haida Gwaii, Queen Charlotte Islands for over a year. You know, I've traveled around quite a bit, commercial fishing, the entire coast. I've been all over in a 45 plus year career with commercial fishing. I've been to bays and inlets and ports that most people don't even know exist, let alone will they ever go there. Because the only way to get there is by float plane or boat. And when I've been in those places, right up until just a few months ago, I was always Tommy 10,000 questions. Hey, what do you know about your local Sasquatch? And I'd hear these stories. I'd hear nice. these encounter reports. I'd hear the tribal perspectives of a different tribe from coastal British Columbia or Omaha Indian Reserve or the people of the Dene nations up in the Northwest Territories and the list goes on. So I just absorb all that knowledge. And then in 19... Late 1980s, um, I was sent into my traditional territories to be our villages. Our village is very famous on Village Island. It's an abandoned Indian village, abandoned in 1968 era. Everyone moved to Alert Bay and Campbell River and Port Hardy because there's no movie theaters, hospitals, schools, grocery stores, jobs out there in the isolated community. So a lot of our tribes moved to the town centers, city centers. So Village Island had massive totem poles. Emily Carr would paint them in the 1923-24 period and when she came to our village with her paint brushes and oils and canvases. And uh, a lot of people would come to the village after, you know, when people weren't there in the early 1900s, when they were out commercial fishing or working in the canneries or up at the rivers harvesting salmon, because we were semi-nomadic as a people for thousands of years and still are to this day. But anyway, the village would be abandoned, so they thought, in the 1920s, and uh, Wiley Blanchett from Victoria would come up in her gas boat with her children after her husband died, and she would experience these villages and take things from the big houses. Little did she know they weren't left property. You know, they weren't discarded. The people just left them there because they went to work for the cannery or fish boat. But anyway, Wiley would write the book, A Curve of Time, and that would sort of erupt Mama La Lakula, village of a last potlatch, because in 1922, in the wintertime, a potlatch was held in our village, and 26, 26 of our people from our nation, our highest-ranking chieftains, noblewomen, and Hamatsas from the Hamatsa Society, a secret society that we Kwakwakiwak have, and I'm a member of it. But anyway, they were sent to Ocala Prison Farm on the banks of the Fraser River, not too far from where you live. And when they returned and told of the horrors that were inflicted upon them in Ocala Prison Farm, and when the chiefs got the word out that all of their masks and regalia for holding these potlatches and their wealth of our tribes was taken by the Canadian government, our people were afraid to potlatch because it was against the law, 1885 till 1951 it was forbidden for our people to celebrate potlatch but eventually we would revive it and it would come out so more people wanted to go and journey to this mama lala kula the supposed village of the last potlatch and then people coming there would write their books and their memoirs and nowadays do their podcasts and video casts and television documentaries well i was there as a native watchman but I remember, you know, in the summertime, I'd, I'd enter there in the spring and I'd work through the summer being a native watchman guardian. And then some years I was balancing that with running a commercial salmon seine boat in the early 1990s. And then when the salmon crash came in the mid 90s, I basically went into Village Island and started Aboriginal Adventures of Village Island Tours, my company that I would operate until 2007. And when I was sued for over $600,000 for defamation of character, Google it, it's out there, I own it, whatever. But anyway, while I lived out in the bush, everything was fine until, you know, the odd time we'd smell something or hear something at night. And you knew it wasn't a bear, a cougar, a wolf, a raccoon, a deer, or another human. Well, to another human, so to speak. And then finally around uh, 
mid October, beginning of October, you start hearing the, but my shirt says whoop whoop, and start hearing that oh, yeah. whoop whoop, and then that oh, a big howling yell that lingers and hangs on for like 20, 30 seconds, and all of a sudden another one answers from another island, and another one answers from behind your where you're staying on village island and plug my ears and la 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 i don't hear that i don't hear that i'm going to sleep tommy and i knew it was the tonoha the sasquatches and i didn't know what they're up to i just knew they were yelling about and uh one time it was when i first heard them really start yelling i was lying in my trailer reading the book by candlelight I was the only one in my, I had a 26 foot trailer with a 10 by 10 foot addition that we brought in for our accommodation on Village Island. But anyway, I'm inside reading my book and I hear a deer eating the plums in a plum tree behind my cabin. And, uh, you know, there's wild plum trees. It used to be, uh, if you read the book, Totem Poles and Tea, it'll talk about the Owens couple uh, that had a dairy operation and gardens for the three villages around where village island is as well as the uh, local homesteaders and loggers and so forth and commercial fishermen but anyway they had planted plums and after they abandoned the place and their buildings rotted away all that's left is the plum trees and their old stone well and some broken glass and pottery but i hear a deer in the back plum trees you know cracking and nibbling away i guess and all of a sudden, I hear yelling from an island, and then the island across from us where the New Vancouver is now, little native community from the Danakta tribe, you hear an answer from that abandoned village at the time, and then not 15 feet behind my cabin trailer, you hear that big male boom and roar yell, and I'm just like left out of my bed, and I'm like, oh my god, there's a Sasquatch right behind my trailer, and you know, I'm thinking that what I thought was a deer in the plum trees was actually a Sasquatch. And now it's yelling to the other ones. And I'm lifting off the bed, grabbing my gun that's beside me. And I'm just freaking right out. It yelled the second time. And man, it was like, this makes you vibrate. It was so loud. And I'm thinking, what are you going to do, Tom? You know, you can't shoot him because you're it's forbidden to ever disrespect them and think of harming them. He's not harming me. So why should I be harming him? He's just yelling. Mm -hmm. So... I'm thinking, what the hell do I do? And that's when I just manned up and I banged the side of the wall of the trailer and I'm boom, 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 boom. Get clear. And all of a sudden you just hear this. Boom, bang, boom. And it turns and walks away into the forest. And I'm thinking, it's that easy? And then that's when I started to learn things by asking questions more and more and then going back into my memory on what I'd heard about Sasquatch and been taught as a young man that number one, you always respect them. One of my first teachings as a young boy was a bunch of men went out clam digging and brought us young pups along, of course. And, you know, it's a learning curve and that's what you're out there for. And also to make it easy for the men, because now you guys are swinging the pitchforks, digging the clams, the kids. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you get to a beach during the daytime, which is pretty high tide. And we're brought ashore and we're told, go look where the high tide mark is, the trees and logs that are on the beach and look for any broken cockle shells, uh, type of shellfish that we call choli, but it's called cockles. Really good eating. Favorite food of us Indian people on the coast. Favorite food of the Sasquatch as well. So look for broken cockle shells, which we found whether or not they were left by a Sasquatch or the older men had put them there as part of the training program. But what they said is you see these broken shells, they still have a little bit of meat in them because they were smashed together and the Sasquatch ate them and piled the empties here and went into the bush when the tide was rising and went to sleep or do whatever it's going to do. But the shells tell us that the Sasquatch is harvesting here. So we got to get back in our boat, row out to the big boat, pull the anchor and go one way or the other a mile or so down the beach or a good distance down the beach to another shellfish beach and do the same thing. If there's no broken shells of the cockle or butter clam, then it's a beach that we can dig at. Sasquatch isn't harvesting there right now. So that's one of the wow. first lessons ever had about how to respect your fellow Sasquatch out there. 
And also, don't ever think of hunting them, trapping them, or killing them. And that leads us into what I'm doing now. Now, for the listeners, I'm going to be coming on to this young man's podcast a few more times to explain encounters I've had. Got chased out of my sea kayak camp in 2006 by three or four real mean Sasquatches. I popped out of a pile of leaves one time on my Indian Reserve Island in 2012 and came face to face about two meters away from a young, juvenile, six and a half foot tall, lanky teenage Sasquatch and hollered at him, yo, what are you doing here? He freaked out, jumped up, took off, scared the bejesus out of him, turned the tables on him, and I'll be teaching you how to turn the tables on Sasquatch. I've had probably well over six really good sightings of Sasquatch, class ones. I've had probably well over 30 encounters where I've heard them, smelled them, or knew they're around me because I lived in the bush for over 26 years. And, you know, and I look behind you on your back wall there and see the mountains north of Mount Seymour, where you took this photograph from top of Mount Seymour. I just feel the pull because mm -hmm. for decades when I lived in bush in the early 1990s, my girlfriend caught her cheating on me. Police gave me an ultimatum to do something or else or not do something so i said you know it's not too good for me out here in concrete world um i'm a round peg in a square hole so to speak or a square peg trying to get in a round hole mm. and i'm not fitting in so i went into bush and i stayed there for years i mean i come out for party in the people's cabaret in campbell river and you know buying clothes cigarettes and tobacco or cigarettes and uh and uh, coffee so I can go back out to my bush world again. And uh, But I lived out there. I worked out there. I became at my industry, especially when the salmon season cl collapsed in the mid-1990s. You know, I, I built an empire out there until I was sued. So my whole time I was out there, and in some cases, I was months, weeks without human act interaction. I didn't want that human interaction. I hated, despised, and loathed humans many times especially after i got sued in 07 so when i returned in 08 to my traditional territories from Haida Gwaii, the common law wife at the time my call her my ex monster now but the mother of my children she pointed to the door a year after her and i lost everything our house in sayward our two hundred eighty thousand dollar tour boat our sixty seven thousand dollar sea kayak fleet uh, we had garnished over, they garnished over $84,000 liquid of mine and two bank accounts in Campbell River overnight. So it was a crushing situation I experienced in 08 when I returned to Vancouver Island with $11 in my pocket. I hated the world and I hated humanity. And I hated the two people that sued me and everyone else that supported them. And I went back into Bush and that's where I got my balance got my mojo back again so to speak okay. and because i've lived like a sasquatch and i have an understanding of where sasquatch is coming from how they feel uh how they look at us they despise us they loathe us they mm. fear us look what we've done to our environment their environment behind mm. you is a picture of pristine old growth rainforest untouched by logging roads or chainsaw or mines and why well, because down below you off your left shoulder is the water reservoir for Vancouver. Right. So, of course, they're going to keep it pristine. They don't even allow you in there except for the old movie crew with the uh, permits. Um, and... yeah. Yeah. So as I was saying, I'll be coming on again in other podcasts to go more in depth with my experiences while I lived out in coastal British Columbia and a lot of what when I was commercial fisherman as well. And then you have the accounts I have from Omaha Indian Reserve. I've been down there twice. Uh, once I was invited by one of the uh, tribal uh, Sasquatch investigation teams. My wife and I went down there, had a, you know, a audio encounter and smell. And then I was invited down there by the chief and council to work, work on the contract for them for two weeks. And during the day I did my job and at night we did Sasquatch investigation. And all I got to say about the Omaha Indian Reserve is, as I was taught down there, it's on like Donkey Kong. There is all kinds of Sasquatches, which they call Sitonga there. And then my ex experiences up in the Northwest Territories and other places I'll be sharing as well. But 
a lot of the listeners might have heard me in many other podcasts. So just for this one an introduction, I'll just elaborate on where I'm going right now. In September, Peggy, my common law wife here in Kent, Washington, and I, we were invited over a year a year ago to the first ever Alaska Bigfoot cruise. So we went to from Seattle to Ketchikan, Juneau, uh, Huna, which is Icy Strait Point, and then back down to Seattle on this cruise ship over eight days. And there was 200 rooms that gather up events bought in November of 2022. And then when they started marketing the state rooms and the lineup, uh, there was uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, David Pilates, myself with Peggy. Within a month and a little bit, they sold out the 200 cabins with almost 400 people. And we went on this cruise ship and it was all Bigfoot related. We wore Bigfoot shirts and everything and everyone was talking Bigfoot and we performed on the stage on the cruise ship as did Dr. Jeff Meldrum and David Pilates. But it was an amazing trip. And it showed that where we've gotten in regards to the Sasquatch industry. So some of you might be listening and go, how come he's not using the word Bigfoot? Well, once upon a time, we used to refer to a certain Indian tribe, and I won't say the name, that was uh, up in the Northwest Territories in Yukon, and translated from the Cree language of my mother, that word would mean the ones with big noses. So they now call themselves something else. You know, they're all part of the Dene Nation. And then there's uh, different groups of the Dene Nation, different tribes. But they don't refer to themselves under that derogatory term no more. And that's one of the things I want to see is let's drop the B word and just call them what they are. Sasquatch or regional names like Sitonga in Omaha, uh, Gogi in Northwest in Haida Gwaii, Queen Charlotte Islands, Hawakwes books, 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 steam them, and the list goes on. But I don't think we need to, you know, in this day and age, repeat our failures of the past and call the Sasquatch by the B word. You know, it's derogatory. You know, how would you like to be called Bigfoot? <laughs> so <laughs> that's where we've gotten to. And it's a multi million dollar industry now. We have conferences all over North America, even the world. Australia is having conferences on the Yowie. Uh, Philippines and uh, Arian Jaya are having uh, conferences on uh, Orang Pendek, the small hair-covered bipedal creature. And I hear there's even talk about something taking place in Europe in the next little bit. So Sasquatch, to me, was like when I first took a Zodiac when I was 15 years old in 1980. I was just a young, wet-behind-the-ears pup. But when I wasn't commercial fishing, I was taking people out on a speedboat to see whales and grizzly bears in the summer. And the following year, in 1981, when I was 16, I participated in the first ever sea kayak with the whales with a fiberglass kayak in Johnson Straits, Western North America. Now, when we look at those industries, boat-based whale watching, grizzly bear tours and sea kayaking, they're multi-million dollar industries in North America. And... That's where I see Sasquatch industry going. And that's why I've started developing the chance encounters and investigating of Sasquatch guidelines. I'm not saying it's chiseled in stone that this is what we need to follow and adhere to. And the governments need to make it into regulation. And the Indian tribes in North America need to endorse it and, you know, activate it so that everyone follows these guidelines i'm not saying that i'm just giving a recommendation as an eco tourist operator as a hunting guide for black bears and grizzly bears for decades that you know i'm well versed in those industries and i should be given my input on recommendations to guidelines for sasquatch like for example turning on the tv and seeing those shows where they're wearing camo and they're packing guns and hey, Bubba, let's go kill us, it's Bigfoot. You know, that is so wrong, you know. Know your history so you're never destined to repeat its failures. So being a North American Indian, I know a lot about my indigenous history. And I know that when the newcomers came to North America, Central America, and South America, they 
didn't do it deliberately at first, but they brought in those diseases that the indigenous people weren't immune to, smallpox, influenza, tuberculosis. And those diseases went rampant, small, smallpox especially, and decimated hundred over 100 million indigenous people. And then when the Spanish came and others in the first round of uh, contact, they wanted to convert us heathen savages that are having these pagan ways and we should accept christianity and be god-fearing and know the bible and they would shove the bible down our throat sideways to a point where they nowadays we have the reconciliation process in canada and we have uh, the residential schools where they're finding mass graves of the indigenous children that died in these residential schools because residential schools were nothing more than incinerators, 186 of them in Canada, to eradicate indigenous people's language, culture, heritage, and way of life. And now we look at Sasquatches and people are on TV wanting to shoot them. Uh, you know, there's... Uh, you know, darn dimes to dollars with some of the t-shirts that are advertised on the internet with Sasquatch with a crucifix, Sasquatch with a crucifix necklace. You know that there's those religious fanatics that are out there that listen to my podcasts and documentaries and conferences that I go to. And I'm proclaiming that I've seen Sasquatch close enough and enough times to understand that they are what I call the perfect human. They're just bigger, covered in hair, and they have, have a, they've evolved to have a nocturnal vision. So if someone goes, evolved to have nocturnal vision. How can that be? Well, let's just take a look at the Inuit people up in Alaska and northern Canada. They have larger livers because they're dealing with a diet that's high in whale and seal and walrus oil. So they have to have a larger liver to process that than other humans throughout the planet. Yet, when we look at the indigenous people from the Himalayas or the uh, um, Andes, they have a larger lung capacity because they live over 10,000 feet for many generations. So that's evolution of body parts in order to live in the areas they choose to live. So Sasquatch has chosen to live at night. And the reason being, uh, the Kwakwakiwak and other coastal tribes of British Columbia our laws in the Kwakwakiwak of old were if someone went into my salmon harvest area, my shellfish beach, my berry patch, my clover patch, my slalberry patch, I, I and my family could kill them with no retaliation to us from the family of the victim because the person was plain and simple stealing our food. That was our law. So you can imagine what it was like uh, 5,000 years ago and beyond when the ice age is still upon us. Even when I was born, there was an ice uh, glacier that went down in Knight's Inlet in Glacier Bay from the top of the mountains right to the salt water. My dad put me on the glacier when they're chipping ice in April for uh, Ooligans, a type of fish we harvest at the head of that inlet. But as a young boy, not a year old, I got my picture, a deer in a bit. I got a picture of me standing on that glacier right at salt water. Well, you go there now, and that glacier is 8,000 plus feet up the mountain. That's how far it's receded in 58 years I've been alive. So in 57 years, that glacier has receded 8,000 feet. So you can only imagine what it was like 5,000 years ago, or six, well, go 6,400 years ago, when the pollen record shows that the cedar trees were just starting to take hold in coastal British Columbia. Hmm. When the, the sediment sampling shows us that the uh, shellfish, butter clams, native little neck were just starting to proliferate throughout coastal British Columbia. Because prior to 6,400 years ago and at around that period, living in present sea level in British Columbia's coast was like living in Barrow, Alaska. It was very hostile, like living in uh, Kugalukchuk or Tuktyuktuk, Canada, up in the North Arctic. So a very hostile place. So you can only imagine what it was like when my ancestors went around the point in their canoes and there's a family of Sasquatches on their cockle beach harvesting at low tide during the mm -hmm. daytime. Well, they would attack them in mass with spears, bows and arrows, knives, clubs, fire. 
and they would kill the Sasquatches, if not scare them into the forest. Mm -hmm. And so that they were that competitive for the food proteins that were available and just starting to get in abundance. So Sasquatches, I believe, made a choice. We can't compete with these other humans because they choose to have fire. They choose to have weapons and tools, which we, as I've been taught by the Omaha Indian tribe, Sasquatch or Sitonga, as they call them, have laws, very strict laws. So they don't use fire. They don't have tools. They won't use axes that are sticking in a round of wood in the backyard by the wood shed. They won't steal that. Well, number one, they won't steal because that's theft. They have laws, very strict laws. They can't have that wood handled metal axe, even though it would make their life simpler. Because if we look at the movie, and I don't know if you remember it, but it's called The Gods Must Be Crazy, 1982, I believe. I remember what movie that is. Yeah. So uh, white guy, no offense to the listeners, but uh, I'm an Indian. So someone of Caucasian background, South African, finishes Coca-Cola and throws it out his airplane window empty. Lands on the sands of the south africa in the bushman's territory he finds it and goes oh i wonder what this is i'll bring it back to my clan well that coke bottle would be used for holding water for pounding grains and the list goes on and the family bushman clan would start fighting over it to at one point as they're fighting over it these two girls one girl grabs it and bonks the other one upside the head now that empty coke bottle has brought violence greed animosity into the clan so the head bushman the father grabs it and says the gods must be crazy i got to bring this to the edge of the world and throw it back to the gods i don't want this it's just brought havoc and thrown my whole culture and society out of balance so this is what sasquatches knew thousands of years ago that if we were to use fire we could possibly lead to where we are right now in an age where we live in fear of rocket man from North Korea and Putin and Biden and the Israelis all in the UK, all with their fingers over buttons because of nuclear fusion, fusion, which is fire. We've gotten to the point where we can eradicate ourselves with a few simple pushes of buttons in the coming months or weeks. Yeah, maybe. It's a scary time. That's what fire has gotten us. Now, if we look at what chipping stones, making knives and scrapers, which would evolve to spears and atolls and arrows, which would lead to copper, which would lead to steel, iron. Look what that has got us. And incorporating metals into fire, we have gunpowder. Chinese would invent that. Now look what gunfire fires given us you know uh how many hundreds of millions of humans have died on this planet because of the invention of gunpowder and the projectile called a bullet a lot of it to me almost seems uh uh unavoidable given the the human brain it's just stuff is just gonna happen through the thousands of years i feel like it's it's just unavoidable it seems like yeah so this is why i'm developing or have developed the guidelines for chance encounters and investigating of Sasquatch. It's not for me to chisel in stone and make law. It's for other people in the Sasquatch community. That's what I call us enthusiasts and writer, authors and performers. It's trade shows and vendor sellers and people that lead expeditions and tours. It's an industry. But we do need to have an industry standard of how we act as a human, because we know as humans, we don't act very good. You know, we're the dumbest critter on this planet and we need some guidelines. We need some guidance. And that's why I've developed these guidelines. And, you know, hopefully Mm -hmm. once it's done, I'll email you the copy. I have to copyright it, number one, sometime this week and finish a few things and tweak it up and then it has pictures and everything and then i'll email you a copy have a good read and then i highly recommend that we do another podcast where we discuss it and you know anyone's listening to this podcast and you're interested uh, once it's copyright i'll be able to get it out i'm also mm-hmm. going to be publishing it in a, as a book so you'll be able to buy a color book that has the guidelines as well as the intro and a bunch of other stuff in there 
Nice. I've already produced Sasquatch Island magazine. If you um, get a hold of me, which is Sasquatch Island Facebook group, that's where I mainly post every couple days. Mm -hmm. I do have SasquatchIsland.com. Gives a little bit of information about what we do as far as tours and expeditions. The art you see behind me, uh, T-shirt I'm wearing, you know, coffee mm -hmm. cup I'm drinking out of. You know, I work with two companies uh, in the United States. I work with SasquatchTheLegend.com in Forks, Washington, and TheBigFootStore.com in uh, Bremerton, Washington. And that's for my U.S. orders for my different designs and coffee cups. Hell, I even got a shower curtain and a bath mat now. And you name it, I oh, got no. a lot of t-shirts. And then, of course, up in Canada, you can go through Text Pro. But the best thing is just email me and I can send you the catalogs for Canada or the U.S. And I do West Coast Native art uh, on bowls. Actually, I'll show you one. So this guy was named Bill Lucci. And he was a Michelangelo of lathe turning. Hmm. And he made this bowl here That's but cool. i put a tunnel there sasquatch silhouette sasquatch and sasquatch footprints right oh, yeah. there so i have over a thousand of these bulls and i put everything from my traditional whales and fish and salmon on them thunderbirds eagles but then because of the interest from the sasquatch community i get a lot of people wanting to buy my bulls with different native designs of sasquatch on it so you know that's what I do. My industry is Sasquatch now. I was yeah. a commercial fisherman for 45 to 48 years. My body's running down. I can't, you know, 58 years old, I can't fish on the salmon, sane boats and longline boats with the young pups no more. They, you know, they work circles around me and I got to go have a nap. <laughs> so I'm I sort I, of, I, uh, I got to ask you, chips. Um, yeah. Sasquatch Island, is that, is that a reference to Vancouver Island or is that something else? Vancouver Island is referred to as Ape Island. Uh, Sasquatch Island was is referred to North America. It's a continent. It's an island it's surrounded by water. Turtle but, Island. Uh, the reason why I call it Sasquatch Island is because uh, the indigenous people of North America refer to North America as Turtle Island. Uh, Hudson's Baby in the Mouth, Aleutian Islands, Labrador, Newfoundland, the Front Flippers, Baja, Florida, the Back Flippers, Mexico into central america the tail of the turtle turtle island this is a sasquatch podcast i'm not going to get into how my ancestors knew it looked like a turtle from space that's Uf ufology so anyway turtle island all the indians refer to it as turtle island i refer to it as sasquatch island north america because every indian tribe has a name for their sasquatch and every other person that lives in Sasquatch Island has a name or an encounter story or a perspective belief on Sasquatch. So North America, Sasquatch Island, you're standing on it. So I've I've got of course some many questions, but um, in, in regards to Sasquatch, uh, do you think that there are different types? Like uh, obviously, there's some in Australia, apparently Indonesia, Asia that apparently look a little different than the classic one we think of over here in the Pacific Northwest, but within the Pacific Northwest and let's say North America, do you think there are distinct kind of types of Sasquatch that look rather different from one, one another? Oh, absolutely. Like even just the uh, Kwakwaki walk, we call the Sasquatch Chunakwa. And uh, we have a male one that's seen in the potlatch ceremonies when a man becomes the chief of a family. Then you'll see the male Sasquatch, and you'll see it in the museums as well. Go to Sasquatch Island. I got the pictures up there. But anyway, we have a little hair-covered bipedal creature that we call Bukwus. Uh, the Bukwus is covered in hair, bipedal, uh, likes cockles like Sasquatch, and uh, is the king of the ghost world is what our spiritual belief on the Bukwus is. But we talk about two hair-covered creatures that we share our homelands with, a small one and a big one. And then when we see the pictures and stuff about uh, skunk ape, you know, it looks more orangutan than it does Sasquatch. The mm -hmm. Sasquatch I've seen in Omaha Indian Reservation look similar, but a little different than our Sasquatch in Vancouver Island region, north. Uh, one of the things that really intrigued me about 
looking for, through a Fleur monoscope in Macy, Nebraska, on the Omaha Indian Reserve, when I saw a pregnant female about six and a half feet tall and a mate with it, a big male about seven foot, a little bit back, seven foot, maybe seven foot four, a little bigger, was they had pronounced hanglets. And they had a really lethargic looking, almost like a FAS individual fetal alcohol syndrome. You know, the mother drank too much while they were carrying the baby. And you see that sort of lethargic, got hit in the head with a four by four kind of look. And then they had the sort of pronounced brow ridges. But when I looked at them sideways through that flur at about 60 plus yards, you know, I was looking at two Sasquatch. And they're walking in an open soybean field where the soybeans were only that high, just freshly planted. But they had that inbred hillbilly look. Mm. And no offense to the hillbillies listening. But anyway, <laughs> I'm talking about the ones on deliverance. Ding, 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 ding. But anyway, that's what they looked like. And I firmly believe that those Sitonga Sasquatch in Omaha Indian Reserve, because it's all clear cut all around the reserve industrial farmlands all around the Omaha Indian Reservation. And the Omaha Indian Reservation is made up of three tribes. The Omaha down in the south, the Winnebago's in the northwest, the Ho-Chunks in the northeast. I might have got the two northern ones mixed up, but anyway, you get the picture. But uh, they look similar, but a little different. And then we you know, hear stories about the, the Naga or Nagani, up in the Northwest Territories in Yukon and uh, Eastern Alaska. It seems to be bigger, more aggressive. And, and there's so many reports on them using clothing. I don't blame them. I lived up in Yellowknife. I know how cold it gets up there. I would, I'd be wearing clothing too if I was hair covered running around out in the bush, but mm -hmm. in the winter, but you know, they're supposed to be a little different. And then I can't speak for other regions because I haven't been there other than uh, Dr. John Bindernagel, my very good friend, uh, some of you listeners know of Dr. John Bindernagel. He was sort of our one of the old four horsemen of the Sasquatch, Sasquatchology. But he lived in Courtney on Vancouver Island. And since 1990, early 1990s, him and I were dear friends. I even held the BinderCon, the first annual Dr. John Bindernagel Memorial Sasquatch Conference in Courtney last uh, um November 2022 right. and uh, Bigfoot Donuts which is in Courtney they gave us like 200 donuts for all the people that came to my conference but I highly recommend you go to Vancouver Island you go to Bigfoot Donuts phenomenal downtown Courtney they even have a, a donut that has a Bigfoot design on it it's pretty good oh nice yeah I'll definitely check that out when I get out there one day um, I know you're in uh, Washington State right now. I'm also very familiar with uh, Washington State. I do a lot of hiking and I, I go down there a lot. I'm fairly close to the border, obviously. Um, when you watch like American television about Sasquatch, they're, they're always talking about Washington and Oregon and whatnot. Um, they often seem to not mention BC, but uh, would you say that do you, do you think there's more Sasquatch the further north you go or like up in BC along the coast uh, than there is in Washington and Oregon, Northern California? Or would you say it's pretty even like per square mile of forest, let's say? Well, number one, being boots on the ground down here for quite a few years now. Peggy and I have been together since 2008 and I've been here since about 2015 quite a bit. But uh, it's clear cut. Like there is no old growth in Washington state, you know, like Vancouver, like British Columbia, we got a lot of old growth left. Mm. And uh, even though the environmentalists would beg to differ, but anyway, mm. Vancouver Island is, for example, is vast, you know, there's apparently 20 to 40 grizzly bears on Vancouver Island right now. Wow. And they've migrated over because of the collapse in the salmon up in the mainland inlets and the overpopulation because no more hunting of grizzly bears. But anyway, uh, you know, you're lucky if you see one or two photographed or videoed each year. Yet there's supposed to be 20 to 26 to 40 grizzly bears on Vancouver Island North. I mm. even hear some of them in the South now. But someone, you know, goes to me, you know, how many Sasquatch do you think there are on Vancouver Island? One or two? I'm like, no, give your head a shake, man. I said, count how many salmon spawning river systems are. There's over 220 
Now, out of those salmon spawning systems, like the Nymphkish River, how many tributaries off the Nymphkish River, Northern Vancouver Island, are there? Well, the Nymphkish River might have one clan of Sasquatches, but there's going to be Sasquatch reports from every salmon spawning stream this time of the year, from midsummer to present, mm -hmm. and into November, in some cases, even into December, because that's where the high abundant protein is this time of year is the salmon rivers. So we're hearing all kinds of reports coming from these salmon rivers of different Sasquatches. So if we were to take the number of 1.5 and multiply it by the 300 plus salmon producing creeks and streams and rivers on Vancouver Island we're looking at probably over 600 sasquatches on Vancouver mm -hmm. Island which so, which is amazing amazing to me because it, it it just seems so odd like like I I know you're of the belief you know it's a flesh and blood creature like a lot of people and of course it always begs the question like how do we not even have a single body ever uh, and it's like, yeah, you know, you you might not see any grizzly bears living a whole lifetime in Vancouver Island, but they're out there. We we know they're out there. When somebody must have seen one or maybe found one, I don't know. But how is it that we just like you you never see one? Is it because they bury their own? Do they take them somewhere, or what do you think? Because I, I hear Sasquatch are often in packs. They stay close to Let's one another. Let's finish your last question about sure. Washington State. Oh yeah, Oregon. sure, yeah. Number one is because they've clear cut the thing and they've urban sprawled the hell out of it. And then you have all of their, like right where I am right now in this uh, Puyallup, Tacoma, up to north of Seattle to uh, almost Bellingham. Um, you have all these cities all along the river mouths and lower reaches of the rivers. Yeah. Well, the Sasquatch traditionally migrated constantly like they do in British Columbia they're going from this time of the year they're in shellfish beds from November through until the herring show up they'll be in that shellfish beds herring show up they migrate to where the herring are spawning in the shallows and then in May they're harvesting the uh, seaweeds and big daytime low tides for the scallops and the other foods that are found at low tide uh, clams aren't good so they have to go after other things like scallops and seaweed and crabs and octopus under the rocks and the list goes on and then when the salmon berries come they go into the, where the salmon berries are and uh, and then all of a sudden as the snows are receding they're following the snows up into the alpine so they can go after the fawn drop of where the ungulates hoofed animals are dropping their babies so that they can have all that lush grass for milk production well that's where the smart bears the wolves the cougars and the Sasquatches are. And then when the forest fire comes, we dumb humans down in the valleys and the mountains are getting our communities and our homes burnt to the ground where Sasquatch just looks and goes, oh, that smoke's gonna come towards us. Let's go down tonight, cross the river, up that other mountain, and we'll watch the forest fire go by. And very seldom will a forest fire go into Alpine on a coastal area. So they're safe up there. And then when they look down and see the backs of eagles and seagulls and the creeks and rivers, they come down to harvest the salmon and then repeat that cycle in November again. So when the Americans say that they have more sightings in Washington and state, bullshit. They just have more people, so they have a high number of sightings. But when you jump in an airplane or a boat, cruise ship and you go up coastal British Columbia from the southern border down by Victoria all the way up to the Alaska borders on the panhandle, British Columbia is a pretty vast coastal region. Oh, yeah. And if you look at it in Google Earth, there's places like Namu. Go look at Namu. It's an abandoned cannery. It has a sockeye salmon river going through the town, old abandoned town up to the lake. Google Earth the lake behind Namu and you'll see the two or three salmon rivers. Well, there's native guardians that go in there with helicopters and they see the tracks and evidence of Sasquatch, but they don't see them because they come in with a helicopter to count the salmon. There's other places where the native guardians, now that the Indians are getting away from their home communities and going to field and being these native watchmen guardians on boats like I did for decades, they're experiencing what I used to experience, Sasquatches. They're having rocks thrown at them. They're getting pictures. Right now I'm following Bella Bella where I'm getting every three or four days blurry pictures of a Sasquatch in a guy's backyard. And every week or so, some really good audio coming out of there being recorded. So as Indians take for granted that, yeah, it's just a Sasquatch, whatever. So if you had as many people in Washington State as there 
up in British Columbia, our sighting counts would, wouldn't be in the hundreds like Washington State. It would be in the thousands because there's so many Sasquatches in coastal British Columbia. I can't speak for the interior because I haven't spent much time investigating in there, but I hear the reports. Prince George, you know, Terrace, uh, uh, Kamloops area, mm. Merritt. I you imagine know, the Rockies would have a lot. Yeah, a lot in the Rockies. Well, yeah. you know, but so that answers that question of why I look at British Columbia as the highest concentration of Sasquatches in North America compared to anywhere else. Because number one, the climate's easy. You can wear a t-shirt all year round almost. Sasquatch can live comfortably year round out there. And when the tide's low on the coast, the buffet table's set. The highest concentration of protein on Earth in its natural setting per cubic yard or meter is a high flow current area passage that is exposed at low tide. Shellfish, bugs, seaweed, snails, and the list goes on. So, you know, that's a scientific proven fact that British Columbia has the highest concentration of protein on Earth in the coastal environment at low tide. And then factor in everything else, elk, deer, the list goes on. We've got a lot of food, but we have very few humans. Vancouver Island. You know, you can go to Vancouver Island and go mushroom picking this time of year behind one of the towns. And you're lucky if you see another human out there. Yeah. You know, so that's oh, even the, even right here behind me, Mount Seymour, you're right by North Vancouver. You as yeah. soon as you get up, get up here, like you're gone. Yeah. And you look at those mountain ranges, what it's like in the summer when there's no snow up there and it's all ungulates with their fawns. You know, it's probably shoulder to shoulder Sasquatches in some areas, <laughs> but that's where they are. And that's why tourists always go, well, I was paddling my kayak for decades. I was sailing my sailboat, traveling in my yacht for decades. I never saw any Sasquatches. Well, of course not. You fool. The shellfish are green. It's summer. It's spring, summer, early fall. There's a lot of sun. What does a lot of sun produce in salt water? A lot of plankton and photoplankton. And what do shellfish eat? plankton and photoplankton so their stomachs are full it's all green well if you make clam chowder with green filled clams you end up with green clam chowder doesn't look too good or taste too good it tastes like the smell of that green algae on the beach and then the protozoan with the uh, goniolix which is guys it's part of the flagellin family because it has one hair that it flips as a one-celled creature it produces a neurotoxin called red tide paralytic shellfish poisoning and that's what that's what blossoms during summer so you don't eat shellfish with months with no r because you might get red tide and besides that they taste like green they taste lousy and they don't cure when you smoke them so Sasquatch know that, and that's why yachters and people on the beach environment, water environment, never see Sasquatches during the summer, very rarely, because they're up in the alpines, up yeah. in the berry patches, sl logging slashes, going after the ungulate fawns. Makes sense. And uh, going back to that other question, what do you make of the fact that it seems, you know, I, I know they're incredibly smart creatures or, or people, uh, but why is it that we just, you know, you can never get a hold of one? As, uh, the native stories from like when I in, have interviewed for a lifetime, I've read the books. You know, I started reading John Green's books and others back in the 70s before you're even a, a figment of your parents' imagination, <laughs> you know. And I was reading these books and going to see the movie, uh, Unsolved Mysteries with Leonard Nimoy narrating. And all of a sudden, I was just like, oh my god, Sasquatch, I gotta learn even more. And so, in reading all those books. I, you know, I was always a smart kid, you know, I was you know, referred to as Dilton Doyle, the Archie comics, because I had big glasses, and my head was always in a book, and I was Tommy 10,000 questions. And that's why I went to Ivy League boys private school, grade eight and nine, because I, you know, I had a higher level of studying and thinking than most people that I ran with as a young boy. But anyway, I asked those key questions, you know, I seen in those books, they didn't tell me about what happened to the dead Sasquatches. And that's why I asked the native elders, what do you know about Sasquatches as far as them, you know, what they do with their dead. And that's when I heard, oh, they bury them, bury them in caves and in Omaha Indian reserve. I was taught that they dig tunnels into the uh, hard soil during the winter like a tunnel cave mine and that's where they sleep and stay warm because it's cold down there and then the springtime or when the 
their that's what those tunnels are they use for their dead they'll put their dead ones in there and collapse them so that they're buried on vancouver island the highest concentration of limestone karst on earth is northern vancouver island and the mainland across the water to the east and north off northern vancouver island well it's swiss cheese from water erosion there's caves that you wouldn't believe when you've actually drive to northern vancouver island where i lived and mushroom picked and hunted and explored and sasquatch investigated and you get your fat ass out of the vehicle and you walk into the bush into the limestorm outcroppings you'll be amazed what you see out there is in regards to cave structure okay. and i'm not a splunker but you know you know we do know as native people that that's where the sasquatch has laid their people to rest my ancestors did the same thing. We have overhangs where they would go put the bodies of our dead people in bentwood boxes and just lay them out lengthwise wrapped in their cedar bark mats. But as the forest duff comes down, pine needles from the evergreens and leaves from the alder and maple and foliage and sticks that are decomposing, it rains down like a mountainside and eventually the entrance that overhang is covered you know i've seen those burial traditional burial places in my traditional territories through the years you know you just see them walk away from them you know and yeah there's some people on there gonna listen and go oh well do you this and that over something about burial the burial grounds yeah it was a cbc fake news story uh someone took a picture of me in native tunics with a cedar bark headpiece for the burial box behind me out of context it was used picture was taken for a year-end chief and council report that I, as the head watchman guardian, had to compile. But someone posted who took the picture on the internet, and everyone said I was taking paying clients into burial grounds. I would never do that. It's so <laughs> disrespectful. It was that, fake that's, news. That's, that's, so unlike, it, that's so unlike the CBC to put out fake news. I can't believe that. Well, yeah, I know. And, you know, there's been a few noses flattened and a few teeth put in the back of throats from my right fist. You know, people coming up and getting a little bit belligerent with me. You know, someone who has poorly developed frontal lobes is going to attack me on something that didn't take place. And they come to a conclusion that I was doing that. Well, I'm not going to rhyme or reason with them because they're too stupid. I just put their teeth in their back of their throat, and walk on. Next person who finds out, oh, it happened to your teeth. Oh, I was talking to Tom about this subject. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'll be bringing that subject up with Tom again oh, <laughs> or ever. So, you know, I, humans I, are I, humans. I'm a bushman. I lived in bush. You know, mm. I like settling my ways, a bushman way. No 911, deal with it yourself. I, I don't have your skills as a bushman yet, but I, I do like it out there quite a bit more as well. Yeah, no, they bury their dead. That's uh, one thing for certain. I have a really good story that comes out of the Shnanaimo nation, Nanaimo, where uh, my sister was talking to an elder probably 20 plus years ago. And the elder brought up how her father went out behind Nanaimo, towards the Nanaimo lakes and was hunting. And he fell down and broke his leg pretty bad. And he was basically crawling back, trying to get to the railway line or a logging road so that he could be saved. You know, he was in a bad situation. I guess it wasn't going too well. And all of a sudden he looked up and there was a big uh, uh, halakwas, what they call Sasquatch. And it came up to him and sort of gestured like, you know, don't touch your gun. And then he looked at the broken leg and everything, couldn't do anything. So the Sasquatch put him over his shoulder. And then lowered down so the Indian hunter could grab his gun. He's not going to shoot the Sasquatch. The guy, the Sasquatch is now saving him. And the Sasquatch began to walk towards the northeast, which is to the eastern edge of Vancouver Island. And they stopped part way. And Sasquatch put the man down and pushed this big rock that was leaning against the rock out wall, pushed it. And there was an entryway going into the ground limestone cars wow. and the sasquatch went behind some trees and a boulder and started digging around and pulled out this three strand rope the size of the man's arm woven from red cedar bark and three strand woven and lowered it into the hole tied it off on a tree or a rock they didn't say and the sasquatch got the man to hang onto his back piggyback and the sasquatch climbed on the hole lowered himself down with that man and as they were swinging like that he could see the cocoons this 
Sasquatches that were partially mummified because they're in a cavern cave and oh. they're in fetal positions and they're wrapped in what do you call it? Uh, cedar bark, like fiber ropes. And, you know, they're cocooned and they're all over on the shelves of this cave. Wow. And the Sasquatch pulled himself up, put the man down and pulled the rope out, put it behind the boulder or trees and then covered it with debris and then pushed the boulder back into place on the hole and then grabbed that man and lifted him up, him and his rifle, and kept walking and got to the edge of the forest where the railway line was and put him down. And that man with a broken leg was lying there looking up and the Sasquatch was just squatted down inside the trees. And then sure enough, the steam train came, logging train, and uh, stopped for the injured Indian. But when he turned and looked, the Sasquatch was gone. But the Sasquatch had shown that man where their dead Sasquatches were. And then the, my sister said, and then that old lady looked at me. This is in the Nile. said, oh, Louise, I got to show you. And she reached up and grabbed a shoebox from a shelf and brought it down. And there was a piece of the rope. My father cut a piece of it when the Sasquatch wasn't looking and I've saved it all this time it's my sister's a cedar bark weaver not a specialist but she can weave and she's worked with it and she said Tom it was really crude so when we peel cedar bark in June and July we take the outside husk bark off the inner bark is what we keep it's copper colored when it dries uh no nope, don't have any on my shelf here but anyway my sister said there was still outside bark on it so it was very crude, but it was three strand. So making three strand rope out of cedar bark, it's not easy. I don't even know how to do it, but some of my family do. So, you know, it's not something you can just bang off. You got to have some frontal lobe development in order to, and opposable thumbs to do it. So there's wow. some good evidence about Sasquatch. Number one, we now know what happens to them on Vancouver Island to get buried and in other places and we know they have opposable thumbs on vancouver island because they can weave three strand cedar bark into ropes so you know it's something that's very intriguing and that's you know, a fascinating story i've never heard a story like that like i say that's why you come to sasquatch island you know it's because i have the and that's why i'm writing things now and why you join the sasquatch island facebook group go to the bathroom grab a beverage, sit down and start scrolling. I guarantee you, I yeah. will educate you, enthrall you, mesmerize you and smack you up head with some really good Sasquatch perspectives that you need to know. So migratory patterns, where they bury their dead, the tie of the Kwakwakiwak Nation to the Sasquatches and far as our art. You know, you go in all the museums, it's mostly Kwakwakiwak art depicting Sasquatch. And who knew that, Campbell River is a city with the highest concentration of wood carved Sasquatches on earth, okay. most of them native. And who knew that Alert Bay is a community, small town with the highest concentration of Sasquatch effigies on earth and masks. And who knew that the Umish the Cultural Center in Alert Bay has a big collection of Sasquatch stuff called Jonakwa, as does the Campbell River Museum, the Royal British Columbia Museum, the Museum of Anthropology. Stanley Park has a totem pole cluster with three Sasquatches depicted on those totem poles. Who knew all of this? No one. And that's what I'm bringing to people, that when you come to British Columbia, you're coming to the highest concentration of Sasquatches in North America. But you're also like when you watch King Kong, the movie, where all these effigies of Kong are there in the movie. That's what Vancouver Island and Costa and Vancouver is like. You know, we have so many carvings. Yeah. So I know you've had, obviously, multiple sightings of Sasquatch and, and you've heard them many times when I... Um, you know, some people may say like, well, how, how has this guy, you know, seen one more than once? Most people can't even find one when they're a, they're a researcher or whatever. Is it because you've spent so much time in such isolated places, you think? Absolutely. You know, number one, while you're sitting there using the people that are listening who might be skeptical of me, while you're sitting there using flicking light switches and flushing toilets and using toilet paper for your back end and turning up the heat because you're cold. I was out there in the bush living like a Sasquatch. And when I was out there and a lot of times I wouldn't have fire. Why would I have fire? It's going to make me stink like fire. It's going to smell up the joint 
while the wind swirls and might change from a southeast to a northwest to a southwesterly while I sleep, all that smoke's going to go all over where I'm at. And when I go out there with my gun and I'm trying to harvest my food, because I never used to bring food in the bush, I brought coffee and cigarettes, fishing gear and hunting gear and shells and bullets. You know, I didn't have space for dehydrated foods and canned food. And I didn't want to pack all that stuff anyway. It makes you sweat. So I would just harvest. Do like a Sasquatch. You're in flux, constantly moving and grabbing, shooting, harvesting. Well, if you smell like smoke or you smoked out the joint while you're sleeping because you're so scared and you needed the fire for security like a blanket, you know, you're not going to have anything to shoot. You don't have breakfast or lunch the next day, maybe not dinner either. So why have fire? And that's why when you wake up at night, you'd hear click, 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 and you'd smell. And buggers freaking upwind to me. I can't smell them or downwind for me. He's smelling me, but you hear the click, click, little snap, little movement. And all of a sudden you're, yo, we kill us, join us. Hello, I don't know who you are. What are you up to, Sasquatch? And you'd hear, ding, ding, ding. And they'd get up move and walk away respect i was respecting them they were curious and came to check me out probably thinking well, that's a human up there i can smell him well, why doesn't he not have fire or when i'm out there they see me and just like when we hear like the guys that are out there listening to this podcast video cast that are loggers hikers prospectors trappers forestry workers mushroom pickers they're gonna go there's no such thing as sasquatch i've been out in the bush doing my career and my mushroom picking and my hiking mm -hmm. all my life and i ain't seen no sasquatch you hear that a well, lot take a look at that painting up there yeah reflection in the eyes of the sasquatch looking through the branches is my wife ponytail boobies backpack walking stick so that's the watcher the peaking sasquatch and I drew it because Sasquatch, like I used to do in the bush, will look down to the branches and they'll see someone wearing jingle bells on the side, bear spray, really nice hiking boots and nice pressed tight pants. And they got really bright colors that say REI mountain equipment or whatever. And they got a backpack with a straw going to their mouth for their water. And they got a real cute hat advertising a corporation that sells hiking gear and outdoor wear and the sasquatch just goes look at that dumb human looking where every footstep goes tripping slipping all dressed brightly colored talking loud not looking up or spinning around eh, just a dumb human i'll just watch him lift the branch up and walk away but the other time it looks and it sees someone who's a forester hunter logger mushroom picker bushman trapper and they see them bush dancing that human they look they know where the next 14 steps are going they're not slipping they're not tripping they're dressed for the forest they're not wearing stupid bright clothing they're you know got a gun in a lot of cases most of them got a knife but they're doing their thing they're comfortable in the forest environment or beach environment well, a Sasquatch is going to grab the branch and pull it down even further and let it go. When the branch comes up and bounces, Sasquatch turns and walks away. The bouncing branch tells the human, I respect you. I saw you as a Sasquatch. I, as a Sasquatch, I saw you, human. I know you're here. I'm going to go about my business. You expect do the same. So it's respect. Sasquatch is conveying to you, let's go our separate ways in respect. Now you look at the logger, trapper, bushman, forester, and they did mushroom picker, and they look at me and go, wow, I can recollect probably three to six times that's happened to me through the decades out in bush where I've seen that bouncing bow, and no bird, no cougar cub, no raccoon, no bear cub. I'm like, yeah, it was Sasquatch just telling you, I'm here too. What about my business? And I've done that through the years, and I've seen so many humans resonate with that. And that shows where I come from. I come from the bush. I've walked in the moccasins of the Sasquatch, so to speak, for months on end. So I know how they're doing it. I even did that to humans before. Look down. 
could smell the coffee and the thermoses they were pouring, could smell the cigarette smoke. I'd been out of cigarettes for weeks. I could smell the peanut butter and jam sandwich because my nose was so in tune with the forest because that's my number one sense out there day and night that as much as I wanted everything they had as this forest crew was taking a lunch break, I just let the branch up, turned and walked away. I hated, despised, loathed humans at that time of my life. And like a Sasquatch, I just blended into the forest and disappeared without them knowing. And that's where I come from, you know? So when people read what I've been putting in Sasquatch Island, they hear the podcasts I've been on, which I don't elaborate too deeply with you, I am. But, uh, you know, when people see that, you know, I do all this native Sasquatch art, I'm at the conferences, I do Sasquatch expeditions on Vancouver Island and here in Washington State. And I'll also, like I tell some people, well, just fly me to Ohio. You want to find your Ohio grass man? Well, isn't it smarter to go charter an Indian guide? Lewis and Clark did that and others did when they were trying to find and and learn about North America and find their roots around it by boat or across it. Be smarter, charter an Indian guide. I'm a Sasquatch guide. Bring me out to Ohio, bring me to Alberta and I'll go boots on the ground with you and teach you things that the other people out there have no clue or comprehension on. And it's one of the reasons why in the Sasquatch industry, you know, like uh, I've not going to name names, but you know, there's a lot out, a lot of them out there that are afraid of me. I know too much and they don't want to put me on their TV shows because I'm going to steal the spotlight from them. That's why we're doing our own television productions. We'll be releasing one here this week. Uh, so stay tuned on Sasquatch Island and you'll see it in other groups, but it's going to be a boomer. And it's one of our first productions. And then YouTube, go to Sasquatch Island on YouTube and see me on different parts of British Columbia, especially on coastal parts of British Columbia, where most of you will never get. I took the time with a video camera, cell phone, and told you about a Sasquatch encounter that took place there, or look at this area. Who knew that the Alpines that we're so accustomed to around the coastal British Columbia, who knew that when you get up past Clem 2, Bella Bella area, that the Alpine technically starts in some places 100 feet inside the tree line and goes up the islands. And I've hmm. been on those islands and seen the trails from Sasquatches up there. I've heard them screaming and tree knocking when I was anchored out in a bay while I was, you know, waiting out, uh, you know, getting trying to go get some sleep while we're commercial fishing, but anchored in the bay that another human probably hadn't anchored in in decades, if ever before. So these are places I've been to, and this is what British Columbia has to offer, just like what's behind you on your back screen. Oh, there's so it much. It's untouched, endless. Untouched, unexplored, other than by like, Sasquatch. There, 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 I did a whole bunch of research on British Columbia before doing a bunch of hiking there last summer uh, with my wife. And uh, it's just, it was unbelievable to me just how many provincial parks there were I've never heard of, let alone all the other land. It's just so massive. And uh, I was wondering, we went to a place that was one, one of my new favorite places, but uh, I imagine maybe you're familiar with it. Uh, have you been up to Stewart, BC? Oh, yeah. Years ago, but I was there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like that place. I like how you could just walk in to Hyder, Alaska, right next door there. No, no border crossing. I couldn't believe it. And then we went up through the mountains to the Salmon Glacier, which yeah. was just one of the most unbelievable sights I've ever seen in my life. It was like just going into another realm up there. Just incredible nature and scenery out in that area, but I, I imagine there would be some, some Sasquatch, some Sasquatch stories in places like that. Well, just going up Portland Canal, like we used to commercial fish up there. Yeah, and uh, Portland Canal, for example, when we used to go up there, we went to Stewart and tied up. Well, of course, well, and got hydrized. You know, I, I was there as a kid with my father when he worked for the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans in 1973 or 75. And when he went to Stewart, you could look above the town and see a blue glacier. Is it still there? I mem I I know there's some like some glaciers on the way to Stewart from Mazayadu yeah. Junction, Junction, like the Bear Glacier. Um, I'm not sure about one you may be talking about directly when you're in Stewart. Well, you wouldn't have missed it if you're downtown, uh, if you're walk coming from Hyder in downtown Stewart, you would have seen it right on the mountain above Stewart. Yeah, well, I would have but seen like it if, say, if it was clear enough. Back then. Right. 
Yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure, but once yeah. you get up into the mountains there and back like toward into BC, that the glaciers up there are unbelievable. It's like being in Alaska or whatever, of course, those ones yeah. you think of. Um, but I was gonna <laughs> ask you about uh there's a couple of little spots I'm curious about if you've if you know anything particular or, uh, in regards to Sasquatch uh in our neck of the woods. Um one of them which is one of my favorite places on earth is the uh, Mount Baker wilderness. Uh, have you heard much about that region? Oh yeah. Sasquatch highway, that Northern highway is called the Sasquatch highway. And then just across from there, of course, is Chilliwack mm -hmm. and uh, leading up along the Eastern side of uh, Fraser river, that mountain range leads you right up to uh, hope. Yeah. Of course that's just chock a block. And then across the river is, is Harrison and Agassiz, you know, that's Ruby Creek. Sounds, you yeah. know, there's lots there. And then, you know, back in the day, I used to do some mule training from Canada back and forth into the U.S., you know, hiking in that area. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of stories in that neck of the woods. But you got to remember that if you're a Sasquatch investigator and you want to become a researcher, the Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall interaction going on. How many haystacks are there in North America? So if you put a needle in every 10 or 20 haystacks and i'm talking a, a knitting needle and bright red so you can see it or fluorescent orange and you go to every haystack that you know you're going to get ten thousand dollars when you find one of these fluorescent needles are you actually going to find one in a lifetime because of all the haystacks in north america i highly doubt it because when i hide those needles i'm probably going to go down some road that says no trespassing and go into the field and pay the farmer hundred dollars if i can go hide this needle well when you get there and see the no trespassing you're now in range with crosshairs turn around or i'm going to shoot are you going to go look in that haystack that you can see from the hill down there times six no but that's where i held head the needle you'll never find it so what i'm getting at is those fluorescent needles and haystacks are sasquatches so you got to concentrate that all of a sudden you say, oh, Tom, um, you live in Abbotsford, right? And I hear that you hid two needles in the haystacks that are on the uh, Chehalis Indian Reserve. So you go to Chehalis Indian Reserve and you count and find out there's a dozen haystacks. In a month, are you going to find one of those fluorescent needles? Yes, probably find both of them and get your $20,000. So that's how you got to look at Sasquatch investigating. You can't be chasing all those bloody needles and haystacks. Mm -hmm. You have to focus on one area and one area only, or up to three because of seasonal migration patterns. So with me, I know where I'm going to go during the shellfish season this time of the year. I know where I'm going to go during the salmon spawn this time of the year and earlier. I know where I'm going to go during the ungulate drop of june and july august in early part of august so put your chips on where you're going to get the most activity don't go looking in a shellfish beach if there's no it's a wrong time of the year don't go in the alpines if it's freaking four feet under in snow or more there's no sasquatches up yeah there. yeah you know like i watch these guys on especially the vancouver island guys i watch them with their investigating tactics and some of these guys that they'll phone me and next thing you know, you see they got their new release, their new YouTube show on how they went to northern British Columbia to look for Sasquatch. And here they were in Bella Coola looking for Sasquatch. And here they are in this place on Vancouver Island looking for Sasquatch. I just roll my eyes and shake my head and think, stupid white man, you phoned me, but you didn't have the balls to say, Tom, how about I cut you in 10% when I sell my show and bring you on board, you and Peggy? And I needed to do this, 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 and put me boots on the ground where the greatest chance of documenting the existence of Sasquatch will take place. And I'll take care of the fuel in the vehicle because we'll be bringing my van or whatever. Hell, I'll do it. Contract me up. I'll do it. But no, they're so greedy with that I, me, and only me exist. And I'm going to be the great savior to document the existence of Sasquatch that they don't use me the way they should with ethics, integrity respect and fairness and cut me in on part of the profits but see what i'm getting at 
And this is what the downfall is with Sasquatchology. Everyone out there is an expert, a researcher, and the only one that's doing it. I'm reaching out to all these people and saying, let's work together. Let's work together. Let's cooperate. And in most cases, the white people I do this to are like, you actually want me to work with you and cooperate with you? Oh, in this modern world, that's not how we do things. You know, that's where we are as a society now. We've lost tribalism. We're individualism now. And if you want to find Sasquatch, you better start progressing back to tribalism and start working with your fellow Sasquatch enthusiasts. Otherwise, you're never going to come up with them. Look at Roger Patterson, Bob Gimlin, and who was the one who contracted them to go document Sasquatch back in 67. Tom Slick or someone else. I forget it. But anyway, they came up spades. They bagged and tagged the big girl. And got Patty on film. Why? Because they cooperated with each other. But it's, right now, yeah, it's still everyone out there's got an ego and a small penis, and it's all about them and not cooperating. <laughs> it, it's still unbelievable to me how that footage from 1967 is still the bar. N not because it's not good footage, but you'd you'd think that there'd be. I know there is footage that some footage is decent, but you'd think there'd be so much more footage now that is even better than that. Because the sniveling, whining bitches sitting in their mama's basement with their keyboard and their beer gut over their Jones that they haven't seen their Jones in 10 years. That's why we don't see it. I've seen some pretty damn conclusive proof of the existence on film, you know, cell phone or trail camera of Sasquatch existence. But do we see it? No. Because as soon as you post something, it's blurry. How come the pictures are always blurry as Sasquatch? Oh, look, that one there, it's, it's definitely a costume. You know, it's a whining sniveler. Smack upside the bloody head and man up, for Christ's sake, and get off the damn keyboard being a warrior. You know, that's why people aren't sharing stuff, because all the sniveling little bitches out there. And this is what I'm trying to change. Like, you come on Sasquatch Island, you sniveling bitch. Oh, I go to your profile, I save your picture, I'll find your email, I'll, I'll hunt you down and find your address and where you work, and I'll put you into the bitch folder, and <laughs> I give you a warning, and if you screw up again, I remove you, block you from my email, from everything, from my Facebook group, and I post a picture of a Sasquatch sitting on a toilet laughing away. You've been flushed from Sasquatch Island. And, you know, someone even said, you, Tom, you got to come up with a calendar, man. With a, who, who all got flushed in 2023? <laughs> because, you know, it's some of those idiots out there. And I've had a couple, you know, get all belligerent in me. And I'm like, hey, look, I'll be at the Kelso Longview uh, Sasquatch conference next month. How about you and I meet and we'll go out in the back of the conference center where the dumpsters are. And you and I are going to eyeball eyeball each other like men out in the bush. And we'll settle all our differences. And I've gone down there and someone's like, hey, remember that guy you said to me the dumpsters? That's him. I'm like, hey, you get over here. I want to meet you at the dumpsters. All of a sudden you see him run out the door. Didn't even bother staying for the conference. Wasted his money for his lanyard and his ticket to be in there. See, I went to I went to that conference. Whining in little 20... small penis little treats we're dealing with. And it's up to us as a community to nip them in the bud and make them accountable for the route and make them accountable for their actions. You know, there's so many Karens out there nowadays, you know, and that's what we got to basically like we do out in the bush, just put their nose in the backside of their face and their teeth in the back of their throat or grab your gun and butt them upside the forehead and knock some sense in them. No 9-1, no court case, problem solved. That person's not going to go down the negative path again. And this is what our society has lost. And it brings a real interesting subject up on Sasquatch. And the Omaha Indian Reserve and other places were finding things like uh, little toys, cars, uh, baby crib things with the squeaker toys and the spinners with colors and the bells and everything. A bicycle with training wheels for a small child with one missing training wheel. Way out. Like I'm talking mile or more, someplace, one case, six miles in the middle of Timbuk flipping nowhere. No overgrown logging road, no railway line, no paved road. But some of the boots on the ground, Sasquatch Island investigators are finding them. What are they? Why are they out there? Well, we know of numerous cases on Indian reserves and other places where people are feeding the Sasquatches so they don't 
boom, get their house hit in the middle of the night while they're watching TV. Let's go out there with your, what we call a green box outside where our food waste goes in those edge of the forest or in the forest houses or Indian reserve bordering the forest edge. They bring out food every evening and throw it out before dark. So the Sasquatches can come in and eat what they want. And that's why I study urban edge Sasquatches. I'm getting old, my knees bad. Uh, it's easier for me to go and set up and watch houses at 1130 at night as the porch lights, lights, bedroom lights go off. And within an hour, all of a sudden you hear the whistles and the whoops and the tree slaps as the Sasquatches come in for the buffet at night. Well, we're in bed sleeping, snoring and farting and REM sleep. Sasquatches coming into our backyards, going after the dog food that's left out, the shed with the feed for our poultry or our livestock, the gardens, the fruit trees and berries we have there. But don't let's not forget what they really come for, the compost bin. And greenhouses, I forgot to mention, but the compost bin. Can you imagine being a Sasquatch in 12 months of the year? You can open up this lid and inside is cantaloupe that got soft, thrown out. <laughs> uh, tomatoes that have a little bit of mold on them, uh, moldy mm. bread. And the list goes on what goes into a compost 12 months of the year, sometimes every three or four days replenished. Mm. And you're sitting there going, they don't know what a kiwi fruit is, but boy, they're like, mm, mm, dang, that's good. I'm yeah, going to come back to this house because every week I get these. I don't know what these fuzzy little things are, but they sure are tasty. Their See, gut can probably I, handle I, the uh, handle the mold and other stuff better than our gut. Oh, absolutely. You know, you look at us, every human tribe on the planet is eating carrion in one form or another. But my tribe, we eat uh, oligan oil. It's, you know, fish oil that fish have been laying on the ground for about a week softening up before we boil them and draw out the oil it's mm. indian ketchup i love it and then you have the the uh european people who will shoot pheasants and ducks and geese and hang them by the necks with guts in and feathers on and when the neck gets so soft that it separates and the bird falls on the ground of the barn or wherever they got it and they pick it up pluck it and clean it you can just imagine what that stink rancid bird smells like but that's a delicacy to some people still to this day. Then you have the Inuit up north that eat uh, stink flipper that they bury in the permafrost ground. And then there's other things where they take seals and fill them up with ducks or something else and sew it up and bury it in the ground. And the list goes on. You know, look at British people. They eat that, what, Marmite? And then the Australians eat Vegemite? Oh, my God, that stuff's horrid, <laughs> It's rancid vegetable matter. So when we look at Sasquatches, we got to look at it on that level that when the snows are receding on those mountainsides in June and July, and they see, now it'll tweak on a lot of people. Notice how the end of April, the turkey vultures show up in coastal British Columbia and Washington State. It's because the snow is receding. And that's where most of the food is the ungulates the animals that didn't come down from the high ground early enough got hypothermia and died and as the snows recede it exposes like opening a refrigerator door it exposes the food and in a lot of cases carry it well all the sasquatch has got to do and i've heard so many reports of sasquatches feeding on exposed animals as the snow recedes in the high grounds so all they got to do is look up and where they see mag um what do you call it? Turkey vultures, eagles, ravens, and uh, whiskey jacks when they get closer. The whiskey jack's going to lead the Sasquatch. Come this way. No, no, come this way. There's oh, yeah. the scared of turkey vultures off. We got to eat. So the Sasquatch goes in there and eats the carrion, which we would call carrion to them. You know, you look at uh, Sacagawea when she came across uh, with Lewis and Clark. So one of the Indian tribes, the winter they got in this one place at spring, but in the winter, beginning of winter, they did a buffalo jump. And in the spring, they happened to be there, Lewis and Clark and uh, Sacagawea, when the ice melted off the river and all of these bloated buffalo from the buffalo jump at the 
beginning of winter were exposed, all bloated. And the people were going in there with their spoons and their knives and just relishing. And whereas Lewis and Clark and his men, as well as Sacagawea, were appalled. But here it was a delicacy to them. Yeah. So that's how you got to look at Sasquatches and how I do. You never bring in that urbanized, concrete, dust e human mentality of uh, I identify in this pronoun. Leave that shit in the city. When you go to the bush, live and walk like a Sasquatch, and that's how you'll get close to them. Do you think that there's any chance the military or any uh, of those types of groups have ever tried to hunt them or catch one or anything like that? Yes. We'll save that for another episode. When we get okay. into conspiracy right, yeah. theory of Sasquatch. <laughs> yeah, so I look forward to that. But like I said, we maybe we should wrap it up for now. But okay, for everyone sure. out there that's listening to this, we're going to do more podcasts. Um, number one, because he's young, up and coming. I want to help him. He's got a great background. I just love it. It's the best one I've seen yet. We've got to get him <laughs> yeah. one of the Sasquatch Island t-shirts to wear. Oh, yeah. But uh, we're going to be opening up a whole different world about Sasquatchology to everyone. So definitely remember, hit the share button so other people can see it. Put, do a post or a tweet that this podcast exists and that he's going to be bringing to you some great content. He's already had Thomas Steinberg on. I'll be recommending other people. And this is British Columbia's own Sasquatch and other podcasts. And we got to see this thing gain some recognition, but you know, go research Sasquatch Island, my Facebook group, my YouTube channel, my website, Google, my name, Tom Seawid, S E W I D. My email is tom.seawid at gmail.com, T-O-M dot S-E-W-I-D at gmail.com. I'll be happy to communicate with you. If you want any Native art or T-shirts or anything, give me a shout. I'll be happy to do something for you. Because remember, Sasquatch is my industry. Yeah. Okay, great. You already know the deal. I was about to say, let, let anybody know listening, you know, where to find you and all that. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> you definitely got it going on there. You know how it goes. Um Okay, well, that's great. I definitely look forward to to speaking with you again on some future future episodes about more of your your experiences and uh, what you think about other things, including some of the conspiracy theories, like the with the military or maybe if they're taking people or or what. But uh, yeah, I look forward to that and uh, definitely uh, share the link, uh, leave a comment, leave a like, up or down, whatever you whatever you like. All all uh, attention is good attention, I guess. And um, share it on Facebook and uh, go check out uh, Thomas's page there, Sasquatch Island and the website and whatnot. Anyways, uh, we'll be back soon with either Thomas or somebody else uh, looking to pump out some more episodes here of the Mystical Mountain podcast. We'll have a nice fancy new uh, place that we're at on a different mountain uh, each time, probably in the background here. <laughs> so anyways, thanks for listening. and. Uh, Hopefully you tune in again and share the podcast. All right. Thank you, Thomas, for being with us today too. Thank you very much.